Hello, this video shows the steps involved in a project to design and fabricate a custom-made quality gig bag for a tuba, specifically a Con 24J with the huge recording bell removed to reduce the bulk. These design details would work for any tuba with detachable bell, or for any other unwieldy object you might want to carry backpack style. With some alterations to the bag layout, these design details can be applied to gig bags for other tubas with their bells and to other musical instruments. A PDF file containing four pages of detailed sketches has been placed at the web page shown here, so you can download it and print it out. It will help to illustrate many details that are too hard to see in the photos on this video. The concept involves sewing a fabric box sized and shaped to closely fit the outer contours of the tuba. The materials used, except the zipper, were all obtained at the local Joann's Fabric and Craft Store and cost less than $70. The primary material is heavy black polyester fabric, preferably a ripstop nylon, but any suitable polyester would work. Check for strength by pulling a bit and trying to stretch and or tear it. Optionally, the bag may be given a lining, and in this project we used a pre-quilted batting material, which is red in this case. Other critical materials include 1-inch and 2-inch nylon webbing belt, such as used in making straps. This kind of web belt is also commonly sold in hardware stores. Finally, this bag depends on having a quality luggage-style zipper available. The length of the zipper must be coordinated with the overall layout of the bag, specifically how much the bag will be able to open to admit the tuba. Most fabric stores will not carry heavy luggage-style zippers in long enough lengths to be of use for a tuba bag. A company in San Francisco, JN Zipper, sells the appropriate kind of zipper and will even sell single pieces of any length with very fast delivery and at an affordable price. Refer to the overlay showing the website, which is www.jnzipper.com. Specifically, a good size is a number 10 nylon chain, black, with two non-lock sliders placed head-to-head, -head, but with no bottom or top stopper. The project shown here used a 50-inch zipper length. Besides fabric, the project requires strap adjusters for the one-inch web belt, and optionally some parachute buckles for the same belt. These are sold in fabric stores next to the web belting. You also need to get some heavier thread than you might commonly use for your sewing machine, and this project used nylon upholstery thread, and the machine was fitted with a heavier needle intended for use in sewing denim. Besides the change in thread and the needle, no other changes were required to the sewing machine. Only straight stitches were used, as found on even the most basic machines. Experiment with different stitch lengths, since most home-type sewing machines will default to a stitch length that is too small for the heavier fabric and material. On this project, the stitches were about one-eighth of an inch long. The bag is made from four pieces of fabric, the front, the back, the bottom, and a fourth piece that wraps around to form the top and most of both sides. First, lay out some paper and rest the tuba on it. Carefully trace the outline of the tuba onto the paper. Cut out the paper pattern and lay on the fabric. This photo shows how the lining was cut first, since the red color was easier to see and mark and photograph. If you do, if you do not wish to have a lining on your bag, simply lay the pattern on the regular fabric instead. Trace the pattern onto the fabric using a chalk fabric marker. This will be the seam mark. Then using a ruler, make another line outside the seam mark line. This will be the cut line. The distance between the two lines will be the margin, as referred to elsewhere in this video. On this project, the cut mark was one inch outside the seam mark, leaving a margin of one inch. But smaller margins, such as three-eighths of an inch or one-half of an inch, can also be used. This photo shows the tuba laid on a piece of cut-out fabric for the lining, and you can see how it is larger than the outline of the tuba due to the extra one-inch margin all the way around. Lay the tuba on the back piece of fabric, and lay the front piece onto the tuba. Make chalk marks to identify the position and orientation of these two pieces. For example, 
Make marks on the upper right hand corner so that you never lose track of which way one piece of fabric needs to be positioned in order to align with the other, and also which side should face forwards. Failure to take precautions like this may result in the pieces being assembled with one or more pieces upside down or backwards, and this will ruin the fit. Choose a spot where the back piece and the front and side pieces will meet. This is determined by laying the zipper out along the seam line at the top edge of the pattern and marking the pattern end fabric with two points where the ends of the zipper are located. These marks will define where the bottom piece and the piece for the sides will, and top will meet. For the rest of this video, these two marks will be referred to as the joint marks. Note that the bottom piece does wrap around the sides somewhat. Carefully work around the fabric, pulling the front and back fabric pieces towards each other and measuring how much of a gap remains between the seam lines, not the cut lines. Do this every three inches and make marks on the front and back fabric to show where these measurements were taken. Cut out a rectangular piece of fabric the length required to align with the seam mark from one joint mark to the other joint mark along the bottom of the bag. The width will be calculated according to the largest gap measurements made in the previous step plus two margins of one inch each, plus a factor that defines how much looseness the bag will have on the tuba. For this project, the looseness factor was one inch. For example, if the largest gap measurement between the front and back pieces was five and a half inches, the width of the rectangle should be five and a half inches plus two inches plus one inch, or eight and a half inches. Use the chalk fabric marker to draw a line down the center of the rectangle and then make marks to either side of the center line. The marks will be every three inches corresponding to the gap measurements made in the previous step. Use the chalk marker to fill in a gently curved line between the marks. These are the seam marks. Make another two parallel lines to the outside of the seam mark lines. These will be the cut lines. Repeat this process for the piece of fabric that will act as the top and sides of the bag. Make this piece at least two inches longer than measurements would, would, would require so that there is some possible overlap between the bottom piece and also allow for errors in measurement and alignment. The excess can always be trimmed later. Cut out both pieces along their cut marks, not the seam marks. With the tuba in position between the front and back pieces, Use pins to temporarily attach the side fabric pieces to the front and back pieces, pinning together along the seam marks. This will test the fit before any other work is done. If necessary, make alterations to the side piece or pieces, or in the worst case, make new side piece or pieces, and repeat the pin test until the desired fit is obtained. The tuba should fit fairly snugly, yet still have a bit of wiggle room. This photo shows the zipper laid out along the center line of the top and sides piece. Ideally, the zipper length should match the length of this piece, or at least almost all of the length. The zipper does not need to extend into the overlap area at each end. However, if the zipper is longer than this piece of fabric, it should be cut to shorten it. Now that the lining pieces have been cut and test fit, transfer their shapes to the polyester fabric used for the bag itself. Trace the outlines using a chalk marker and make the cut lines slightly beyond the edges of the original paper pattern or the lining pieces, whichever you choose to use for this purpose. Using a ruler, make seam marks on the fabric one inch in from the cut lines. Since the cut lines have been made slightly larger than the lining dimensions, the seam marks will also be slightly larger and this will result in the bag being slightly larger than the lining. If they were exactly the same sizes, the lining, being fairly thick, would be somewhat bunched up inside the bag. Cut out the back, front, bottom, and top and sides pieces. Note that on the original project, it was decided that the polyester fabric was not as heavy as desired, so two pieces of this fabric were cut for each of the four bag pieces, providing for a double layer of fabric on each piece. The layers were held together with pins and sewn around the outside to hold them together. These stitches were made about one-eighth of an inch inside the edges of the fabric, not anywhere near the seam marks. A few stitches were also made across the larger dimensions of the fabric to better hold the layers together and prevent shifting. At this point, it is worthwhile to mention the importance of using locking stitches when sewing this bag. 
Most modern sewing machines will automatically sew a locking stitch pattern at the end of each stitch, providing this feature is enabled, and this prevents unraveling of the thread. Now that the major fabric pieces have been cut, the next step is to fabricate the shoulder straps. Start by obtaining a suitable padding material. This may be some sort of leftover quilted batting material rolled into coils. It may be some suitable foam, such as weather stripping or lengths of foam cut from the tubes of plumbing pipe insulation foam sold in hardware stores. For this project, some scraps of closed cell polyethylene foam, often used in seat cushions, was available. The padded area of the shoulder straps is about 12 or 13 inches long, so the pieces of padding need to be that same length. They should be perhaps one inch wide and three quarters of an inch deep, and the two pieces are required for each shoulder strap. Depending on the padding material used, it may be a good idea to trim the ends of the pads to taper them to something of a more rounded shape. For the shoulder straps, cut out two long rectangles of polyester fabric. There is no need to make these pieces using double layers of fabric. If possible, refer to the downloaded sketch. The length of these pieces will be 19 inches and the width will be 7 and 3 quarters inches. If your pads are a substantially different size than 1 inch by 3 quarters of an inch, the width of your fabric pieces here will need to be adjusted. The idea is to have enough width to wrap tightly around both pieces of a given shoulder strap, meet in the middle between them, and have enough between to allow the edges to be folded over by one quarter inch on each side and stitched. Once the fabric is cut out, fold over the long end edges by one quarter of an inch on each edge and iron flat. Roll the fabric into a long tube with the folded under edges towards the inside of the tube and the one quarter inch rolled edges overlaying each other. Adjust the tube so the center line of the rolled over edges is centered. Use pins to hold the fabric in position. Sew a seam down the center of the tube, centered along the width of the tube, in other words, one eighth inch in from the visible edge of the outermost rolled edge of fabric. The result will be a tube in figure eight cross section. Repeat for the other shoulder strap. Lay the pads onto the figure eight tubes and referring to the downloaded details, make chalk marks to define where the pads will be located lengthwise. The pads should be starting at approximately two and three quarter inches from one end and the other end of the pads should be about three and a quarter inches from the other end. Also make marks one quarter inch from each end of the tubes to show where the ends should be folded over. Test fit the first couple of inches of each pad into its part of the figure eight tubes and adjust the thickness of the pads if they are too tight. Cut a length of stiff wire such as coat hanger wire and tape one end to the end of a pad piece using scotch tape. This will allow you to push the wire into each fabric tube effectively pulling the pads along with it. This works much better than trying to push the pads into the tubes. Once each pad aligns with the chalk marks on the fabric tube Pinch the end of the pad through the fabric between your fingers and pull the wire free of the scotch tape, leaving the pads inside the tubes. Repeat for the other pads. Sew along the chalk line that is three and a quarter inches from the ends of the tubes, making a seam as close to the pad as possible. If your sewing machine allows the needle to be offset closer to the side of the sewing foot, this will help make the seam closer to the pad. Cross stitch between this seam and the end of the tube, in other words, sew a large X pattern across the fabric that lies between the pad and the end of the fabric. Fold over the end by one quarter inch and sew to hold the fold down. Now compare the flat area of fabric that has the cross stitch with the width of the wider web belt you purchased earlier. If you bought a three inch web belt, no further adjustment to the shoulder strap is necessary. If you purchased a two inch web belt, fold over the end of the fabric again by one inch, effectively reducing the three inch flat area between the pad and the end of the fabric to a two inch flat area. The idea is to avoid having the flat area at the end of the strap be longer than the web belt is wide. 
cut a short length of the one inch web belt with the length being about seven inches. This will allow this piece of belt to start at the pad on the remaining end of the shoulder strap. In other words, the end knot sewn in the previous step. Extend one inch beyond the fabric, go through the strap adjuster buckle, and return back to the other end by the pad. Lay the padded fabric tube down with the uglier side of its long seam facing up. Fold over one quarter inch of the length of the fabric and lay the one inch web belt and strap adjuster buckle onto the fabric so the ends of the belt are near the end of the pad. Make sure that the strap adjuster buckle is right side up. Remember that the side of the shoulder straps padded fabric tube that is currently facing up will be the side of the strap that is against your body so the outside face of the buckle should be oriented facing down at this time in the assembly. Fold over the sides of the fabric to make a tapered end wrapped around the belt near the strap adjuster buckle. Use a pin to secure the fabric folds of the belt. Sew along the end of the pad and at the chalk line that is two and three quarter inch from the end of the fabric tube, making the seam as close to the pad as possible. Again, use your sewing machine's needle offset here if you can. Next, make several stitches around the flat area of the fabric tube so that the stitches secure the web belt to the fabric and also hold the tapered side folds of fabric. Shown here are the tapered ends of the two shoulder straps and it is apparent that the shoulder strap adjustment buckles are located about one inch from the tapered ends. This photo shows some of the several cross stitches on the tapered end of the shoulder straps. And this photo shows the inner side of the same straps. As an option, Cut two triangular pieces of fabric, fold over the edges and iron flat, then sew them to cover the exposed end of the web belt and fold it over tapered sides of the shoulder strap. The inner sides of the two shoulder straps should be positioned about four inches apart, and the top end of the padded part should be approximately 28 inches from the bottom end of the bag. On the back side fabric piece, Mark a horizontal chalk line at this 28-inch location and find the point that is centered from side to side along this line. Make two marks, two inches to either side, which will show where the inner sides of the shoulder straps should go. Lay the two shoulder straps, outer side facing down, onto the back side fabric piece, positioned to line up with the two chalk marks from the previous step and with the ends of their padded areas along the 28-inch line. Lay the 2-inch or 3-inch web belt along the backside fabric piece so that it covers the flat ends of the two shoulder straps and its top edge is along the 28-inch line. Use pins to hold it in place and use additional pins to secure the flat ends of the shoulder straps. Sew along both edges of the 2-inch or 3-inch web belt then cross stitch the area where the belt passes over the ends of the shoulder straps. The function of the wider web belt is to distribute the strain of the shoulder straps to a wider area and also to prevent puckering of the backside fabric piece due to that strain. Since all the weight of the tuba rests on these two points of the bag, it is a good idea to have extra stitching in this area, so be generous with the cross stitching. The bottom ends of the shoulder straps are made from one inch web belt and they will be permanently sewn to the very bottom of the bag and their inner edges should be only a couple of inches apart. Anywhere from between two inches and four inches is appropriate but the photo shows a two inch separation. Cut another short piece of the one inch web belt long enough to cross over both the shoulder strap belts plus a couple inches extending beyond on either side and located about two inches from the bottom center of the back side fabric piece. Make sure to remember that the first one inch margin along the bottom of this fabric piece should not be counted since it will be folded inwards. Also allow the two shoulder strap web belts to extend slightly beyond the edge of the fabric. Pin the web belts to the fabric. Sew along the edges and ends of the short piece of web belt then cross stitch where the belt passes over the two shoulder strap web belts and finally Sew along the edges of the shoulder strap web belts in the area between the short piece 
and the edge of the back side of the fabric. Do not sew the web belts anywhere on the side of the short piece towards the top of the shoulder straps. Use a small flame to fuse the ends of the two shoulder strap web belts and following the instructions provided with the two strap adjuster buckles, thread the web belts through the buckles. Allow extra length for the shoulder strap web belts as it can always be cut shorter once you see how the finished bag fits your body when carrying the tuba. Always remember to fuse the ends of the web belts using flame to melt the nylon fibers. Optionally, the gig bag may benefit from having two straps that wrap all the way around the bag, allowing the bag to be cinched tightly around the tuba. To keep these optional straps in place, sew on four short lengths of one inch web belt to each large fabric piece, meaning the front and back side fabric pieces. They should be located just below the point where the sides of the bag start to curve at the top and just above the point where the bag curves at the bottom end. They should be located perhaps three inches inwards from the edges of the fabric. In addition, they should be long enough to have one inches at each end for sewing them to the fabric, while having a loose area at the center that is large enough to allow the strap adjuster buckles to easily pass through underneath. Cross stitch these eight short web belts to the front and back fabric pieces. Now that the shoulder straps have been finished, the zipper has to be addressed. While the fabric piece for the bottom bow will remain unaltered, the longer fabric piece for the sides and top bow will need to be cut in half lengthwise at a, to accommodate the zipper. Carefully mark the center line with chalk and then sew a long stitch just slightly to either side of the center line. Cut the fabric in half along the center line. The next step is critical, so measure carefully. Move the sliders along the zipper to determine exactly how close the fabric can come to the edge of the zipper without binding the sliders. This point will be located on the fabric margin of the zipper. Now measure from this point to the center line of the zipper. Transfer this measurement to the edges of the long fabric piece that you cut in half, with the measurement transferred to the inner edges where you cut it. This marks where the fabric needs to be folded over and ironed. Do this now making sure to fold the fabric towards the inner surface of the fabric so the folded edge will be invisible from outside the bag. Carefully pin the fabric in place to the fabric margin of the zipper, aligning the folded edge with the point you determined was where the fabric should go to just miss binding on the sliders. If your sewing machine has a special zipper foot, attach it at this time. The objective now is to sew the folded edge of the fabric to the fabric margin of the zipper, placing the stitch line very close to the folded edge and making a very straight stitch. The zipper foot will help this, and you may also need to adjust the machine so that the needle is offset closer to the side close to the zipper. Once the fabric piece is sewn to the zipper, test to make sure that the sliders move freely without binding on the fabric. If all is well, repeat the previous steps and sew the other fabric piece to the other side of the zipper. Readjust the needle and or zipper foot position to sew another stitch parallel to the first stitch on either side of the zipper. It is best if you can place the sep second seam or stitch at a location where it will go through both folded layers of the fabric but depending on the width of the zipper, this might be impossible in some cases. Regardless, two rows of stitches are required for strength. The finished zipper should look like this photo, and you should be able to easily move the sliders along the entire length. Hand stitch over the zipper at each end to prevent the sliders from moving all the way to the ends, and to keep the ends from separating. About 10 loops of thread should be adequate. Now the carrying handles need to be made. Even though the tuba will normally be carried using the shoulder straps, you need something to carry the bag when you are only moving at a short distance or when lifting it into the car, etc. Two handles will be made by adding padding to one inch web belts. Refer to the PDF diagrams and cut 15 inch lengths of web belt and fuse the ends. The prototype bag used thin strips of closed cell polyethylene foam for padding the handles one inch wide and five inches long. 
Each strip was about 3 16 inch thick. Any number of things can be used as padding for the handles. Whatever you use, attach it to the center of the web belts. You can use rubber cement, stitching, or tape. Cut two rectangles of fabric, 7 inches long, by whatever dimension will wrap tightly around the padded part of the handles, plus an extra half inch. Fold the rectangles over lengthwise, and sew down the overlapped edge at one quarter inch from the edge. Now starting from one end of the resulting fabric tube, roll the tube inside out so the seam is on the inside. Slip the fabric tubes over the padded parts of the handles and adjust until there is one inch of tube to either side of the padded area. Sew along the edges of the padded parts of the handles, placing the stitches close to the pad as possible. Optionally, roll the ends of the fabric tube under and iron flat then cross stitch the flat area of the fabric to either end of the pad. Use the chalk marker to mark the center point of the edge of the front and back fabric pieces, making the mark only on the edge that will be along the side of the tuba that has the mouth pipe. The idea is that when you carry the tuba using the handles, the mouth pipe side is facing up in order to avoid setting the horn down on that side and damaging the mouth pipe. Note in some photos that the prototype bag was made with the handles on the side opposite the mouthpiece or mouth pipe side of the tuba. This was corrected later by opening the seams, unsewing the handles and relocating them. Locate the ends of the web belts as shown and cross stitch them to the edges of the fabric, both the front and back pieces. Also note that the handles are sewn to the outside surfaces of the fabric even though the ends of the web belts will eventually be on the inside where the fabric is rolled over at the seam. Assuming that you are planning on having an internally padded lining on your bag, the next step is to sew Velcro to the inner surfaces of the bag. It is important to understand that the side pieces of the lining are not cut in half lengthwise in the way that the outer fabric was to accommodate the zipper. Instead, the side lining pieces will overlap the zipper and extend the full length of the sides. Because of this, the large lining piece that will be attached to the front fabric piece will not be sewn to the rest of the lining at all and will be attached to the front piece using Velcro strips all along the edges. Pin the Velcro in place, note noting that there is no need to try and make the Velcro follow the curves at the top and bottom of the bag. Simply use straight strips as shown. It does not matter whether the hook or the loop side of the Velcro is attached to the fabric, just be sure to be consistent. Sew the Velcro strips to the fabric using one long seam on each edge of the Velcro. The rest of the inner lining will attach to the outer bag using Velcro, but the lining will be assembled with the sides sewn to the back piece, forming a tray. Unlike the front piece of lining, the main lining tray will attach using Velcro strips located along the sides instead of on the large back fabric piece. For the bottom bow pieces, the Velcro can be centered on the fabric as shown. For the long fabric piece with the zipper, the Velcro should be sewn alongside the zipper as close as possible. The Velcro can overlap the fabric margin of the zipper. Note that the Velcro will be on the side of the long piece that will be sewn to the back piece of fabric, not to the side of the long piece that will be sewn to the front fabric. Now that all the straps, handles, and other web belt pieces and Velcro have been sewn to the outer bag fabric pieces, it is time to sew those pieces together. Make sure that the one inch margin along the sides or the edges of the fabric is still clearly marked with chalk. Make sure that all the pieces are properly oriented, aligned, correct side out, and pin them together with the one inch margin chalk lines touching. Remember that these pieces will be sewn together inside out and then the whole bag turned right side out to end up with the seams on the inside. Triple check this before doing any sewing. Slowly sew along the edge of the margin along the chalk lines, going even slower in the curved areas. I found that it was best to sew about two inches, stop, raise the sewing foot, reorient the fabric, lower the foot, 
and repeat all along the curves along se uh, the seams. Also note that the edges of the bottom bow piece are not sewn with the ends of the long piece that has the zipper. Keep these ends separate from each other to allow for adjustment when sewing the seam all the way around, but make sure that the bottom piece is oriented so that it will ultimately be to the outside, covering up the ugly ends of the zipper along the long piece. These ends will be joined in a later step. This photo shows the back fabric piece sewn to the side pieces, then turned right side out with the Velcro strips on the inner surfaces. This is a good sanity check before sewing on the remaining front fabric piece, but be sure to turn everything inside out again before doing that sewing. Once the fabric pieces are sewn together along the chalk lines, make a parallel seam about one quarter inch to the outside of the fabric for strength. On the bottom bow area, make a third seam closer to the edge, since this area will be holding a lot of the weight of the tuba, and if the primary seam lets go, there will still be two more seams for safety. Also make three rows of stitches in the area where the web belts of the handles will meet the fabric. This photo shows the completed outer bag inside out with the Velcro visible. Now turn the bag right side out. This photo shows the completed bag turned right side out. Verify that everything that is supposed to be on the inside is there and everything that is supposed to be on the outside is there. In order to attach the ends of the bottom bow fabric piece to the ends of the long fabric piece that has the zipper, it will be necessary to either hand sew them together, since the sewing machine cannot get to those areas now, or attach them using some sort of adhesive. I chose to attach them using adhesive-backed Velcro, which allows the Velcro to be fused to the fabric using the heat from the iron. Then the two sides of the Velcro are joined to hold the fabric together. This photo shows the heat-fused hook side of the Velcro and the heat-fused loop side of the Velcro on the ends of the fabric side pieces where they overlap. Once the two sides of the Velcro are attached to each other, the fabric can then be joined. Move the sliders to the ends of the zipper and fold the top edge of the front side of the bag over and slip the tuba in. If all measurements and assembly were done correctly, it should fit with only a slight amount of wiggle room. The remainder of the steps involve the inner lining. Starting with the front piece, remember that it was cut with the same one inch margin as the corresponding piece of fabric for the outer bag, although it has no seam area. Instead, fold over the outer one inch margin of the front lining piece, making the fold towards the front side so that the folded over edge will be hidden once the lining is inserted inside the front of the bag. Sew along the perimeter, placing the seam about 3 16 of an inch from the folded edge. Then make another seam along the outer edge of the fabric where the batting between the quilted layers is visible. Flip the front lining piece over and it should appear as shown in this photo. Lay this piece inside the front of the bag and carefully make sure that it is aligned. Make marks on the side of the lining that is against the inside of the bag where the Velcro strips are sewn. Sew Velcro to the front lining piece in locations marked in the previous step once again placing the seams along both edges of the Velcro. Using the same method for marking the lining where it contacts Velcro inside of the bag, lay the long side piece of lining that corresponds to the zipper area of the bag, making sure to discount the one inch margins. For the margin that will contact the back of the bag, simply hold the chalk line defining the margin against the seam of the bag and then check Velcro position and make marks on the lining. For the shorter lining piece that will be used for the bottom of the bag, simply place the Velcro on the center line since that is where the Velcro is on the bag itself. Sew the Velcro to the lining pieces. Keep in mind that on the edges of the side pieces that face forwards and will not be sewn to the back piece, there is still a one inch margin. In this instance, fold this margin over and sew two seams, one near the fold and another th near the edge of the lining. The fold should be towards the outside away from the tuba. Since the back lining piece will be sewn to the side pieces and those side pieces have Velcro, 
There is no need to put Velcro along the edges of the back lining piece. It will be held in position within the bag by the adjacent lining pieces. However, it is a good idea to put a patch of Velcro near the center of the back piece, both on the bag and on the lining as shown here. This patch can be made from three or four short lengths of Velcro laid side by side. Since the lining goes inside the bag, its seams will be hidden by facing outwards, not inwards as they do on the bag itself. Because of this, the lining is not sewn together inside out. Take note of how much overlap there is on the bag side pieces, meaning between the bottom piece and the piece with the zipper, and make a similar overlap between the bottom and side pieces of the lining, and place a couple rows of stitches to attach them. It is a good idea for appearances to roll over the exposed edge before sewing them, so there are no exposed batting remains visible. Only do this seam on one side of the bag, because the exact amount of overlap on the other side cannot be known until the sides are sewn to the back piece all around the edges. Aligning the one inch margin chalk lines, pin and then sew the side lining pieces to the back lining piece. There is no need for multiple rows of stitches here, since the lining bears no load, and because we want to trim the lining as close to the single seam as possible to make it fit inside the bag better. After sewing all the way around, sew the remaining overlap on the side pieces. Trim the lining close to the seam, perhaps one eighth of an inch from the seam. Note the center velcro patch in this photo. This completes the lining tray. Reach inside the bag with the front lining piece and, aligning the velcro strips, attach the lining to the inside front of the bag. Lay the assembled lining tray inside the bag and after adjusting the alignment, press the velcro on the lining to the velcro on the bag in all places where there is velcro. The lining is now firmly attached to the bag, but can be removed for cleaning or for repair of the bag. Remember that with the lining removed, the bag itself can be turned inside out and all seams will be accessible for repairs or alterations. This is one advantage of attaching the lining this way instead of trying to sew it to the bag. On the Con 24J tuba, as well as on many other models, some parts of the horn might protrude and press hard against the inside of the bag while carrying the instrument. Also, some items like water keys can present sharp points that can dig holes in the lining or fabric. On the 24J, I found some stretchy foam carrying cases at the fabric store intended for holding wheel-style fabric cutters and they fit perfectly over the most exposed tuning slides, simultaneously protecting the water keys from damage and the bag from being torn by their sharp points. This photo shows the tuba being inserted into the completed bag, and this photo shows it fitting nicely inside. Note how the side pieces of lining extend up past the zipper to protect the instrument's finish from scratches. This photo shows the essentially completed bag from the bottom, and this photo shows the bag from the top. What remains is to add the optional straps around the bag. If you made the bag with the optional web belt pieces to hold the encircling web belts, cut those belts at this time, fuse their ends, and fit them to the parachute buckles, cross-stitching as required on one end of the belts. By loosening the bottom strap and taking the top strap apart at the parachute buckle, the ends of the upper strap can be pulled back to allow the bag to be opened for inserting or removing the tuba, then rebuckled and tightened around the bag to prevent wiggle when carrying the instrument. The bag is now ready for transporting the tuba. With the shoulder straps loosened, it is easy to get on, and once on, the loose ends of the straps can be pulled down to cinch them up tighter. Lifting the front edges of the strap adjuster buckles loosens the straps again. The prototype bag did not have any pouches for carrying mouthpieces, valve oil, or other accessories. You may want to add some exterior pockets to your own bag, but on the prototype I decided to carry all those odds and ends inside the bell. To this end, a small drawstring bag was conceived to be held in place using three elastic loops that fit over the bell screws. The elastic used was quarter-inch braided elastic cord readily available at fabric stores. Small plastic rings were purchased to fit over the elastic loops in order to make it easier to grab them and pull them over the bell screws. 
Since this bag is closed by a drawstring, a so-called cord stop with internal spring is used to secure the drawstring easier than tying it. Obtain a suitable fabric for the pouch. On the prototype, it was a lightweight red denim. Cut a circle from the fabric based on the diameter of the inside of the bell tube plus a 3 8 inch margin all around. Then a rectangle of the same fabric should be cut for the body of the bag. The short dimension of the rectangle is based on the desired bag length plus a 3 8 inch bottom margin plus the radius of the circle piece. The long dimension of the rectangle is based on the circumference of the circle, not counting the 3 8 inch margin around the outside, plus a 3 8 inch margin on each end for the seam. Remember that the circumference is calculated by multiplying the diameter by the constant of pi, which for our purposes is 3.14. Along one side of the rectangle, fold over about 3 16th of an inch and iron flat, then sew down the middle of the folded edge to secure it. Note that for this accessory bag, you should not use the heavy upholstery thread and should use a finer thread such as used for a normal clothing, uh, hemming, and so on, and also use a smaller stitch length setting on your sewing machine to get finer seams. Select a long cord for the drawstring. There will be a number of choices at fabric stores and craft stores. You want one that is not too thick, perhaps 3 30 seconds of an inch diameter or so, but be able to fit through the holes of the cord stop you plan to use. It should also be a weave or braid that does not stretch lengthwise. The length of the cord should be based on the dimension of the longer side of the rectangle plus at least 6 inches or 3 inches on each end. Fold over the edge of the rectangle that was sewn in the previous step with the amount folded over forming a sleeve through which the drawstring will pass. A folded dimension of perhaps 3 8 of an inch is appropriate. Iron this new fold and lay the drawstring along the folded edge under the flap formed by the fold, then sew along the edge seam in the previous step to form a sleeve around the drawstring. Sew the rectangle along the 3 8 inch margins at each end forming a tube. Be careful to sew it such that the more attractive side of the drawstring sleeve will be on the outside of the finished tube, and remember to turn it inside out before sewing the seam. With the tube still inside out, pin the bottom margin of the tube to the margin of the circle and sew a single seam all the way around. Since this is a fairly tight curve to sew, go slowly and make frequent corrections in angle. Turn the bag right side out and push the seam of the circle outwards to get the full tubular shape. At this time, make sure to take steps to prevent the ends of the drawstring from unraveling. If the cord is nylon or other synthetic, it can probably be fused over a flame. If the cord is something that cannot be fused, seal the ends with super glue or other adhesive, or simply tie knots in the ends. Make sure to pull the drawstring ends through the cord stop holes first. Cut three lengths of elastic cord, with a length based on a one inch margin at each end, plus whatever length seems good to pull over the tuba bell screws. Remember that the elastic must be stretched to fit over the screws, if it fits over in its unstretched state, it will be too loose. Cut three one-inch long pieces of the one-inch web belt and fuse the ends. These patches will be sewn over the ends of the elastic cord where they attach to the sides of the bag. Make a chalk mark around the fabric bag at the point where you'd expect it to align with the rim of the bell tube. The distance from the drawstring to the line should be a dimension calculated by subtracting about half an inch from the radius of the circular end of the bag. Mark three points along the chalk line, corresponding with locations of the bell screws. Fit an elastic piece through the plastic ring, fold the elastic over so the ends meet, and hold the ends to the sides of the bag at one of the marks, one inch below the chalk line. Remember that the chalk line defines the edges of the bell tube the ends of the fabric will be one inch below that. Place one of the web belt patches over the elastic ends with one edge of the patch aligned with the chalk line and cross stitch over the entire patch, sewing through the elastic under the patch. 
the area sewn is close enough to the drawstring edge to allow the sewing machine to get at it if the open end of the bag is slipped over the machine the way a sleeve or pants leg would be. If your machine is very old or a simple model, it might not allow this and hand sewing the patches might be necessary. Follow the same procedure for the other two elastic loops with their rings and patches. This photo shows the finished bag with the drawstring and elastic loops. This is another view of the completed drawstring bag. This photo shows the bag inside the tuba bell tube with the elastic loops around the bell screws. Hopefully watching this video will give you ideas for how to make a similar bag for your instrument. I apologize for the fairly tedious nature of this video and my attempts to describe many of the tricks and points I learned in making the prototype. I know it's dry listening, but hopefully it will prove of some value to you.